Welcome to the Tepper School of Business Multimedia Series. For more information on the Tepper School at Carnegie Mellon, please visit us at www.tepper.cmu.edu slash multimedia. And now, here's your selected video. Bill, welcome. Thank you. It's great to see you again and to, for, for you to come to Tepper School at Carnegie Mellon. For people who might be wondering what this coded talk is about, see you again. Here's the man who gave me my, gave me my two biggest breaks in life, although there might have been moments when he regretted it. He hired me into I wanted my money class. back. <laughs> and, Bill, it's clear to me you are in your element mm -hmm. with young people. Mm -hmm. I have to share this too before I start here. Uh, I was expecting to get a call from the airport uh, or a report from the airport that Mr. Green is in the car, wheels rolling. And around 11, 10, I said, I haven't got the call. Then I learned something happened. So I said, better rush down. Turned out Bill was already there for the previous 15 minutes mingling with the students and recruiting. <laughs> <laughs> I know from where I've worked with Bill that he derives great <clears throat> energy from interacting with young people. That's his passion. So the format we'll follow is I'll ask maybe three, four questions just to get the ball rolling, and then we'll open it up to the floor. We'll go until about 1.15 or so. And for people who are in the class, uh, honorary Professor Bill Green will also be teaching the class today. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I, I'm delighted to be here. I see I'm being filmed. <clears throat> I would just warn you that it, everything I spoke are all around the world. And Accenture operates in 120 countries, and I've probably been in 80 of them. And they film me everywhere. And sometimes they have to edit my material. So <laughs> I'll just, I just warn you back there. that, uh, And you can tell by their faces what parts they think should be taken out. So, so just don't put it out on YouTube or any of that, all right? But you can use it a a any way you like. Uh, but I I'm delighted to be here. You know, I did go to, uh, to uh, Babson College. But uh, Dean College, what he mentioned at the end <clears throat> was um, the college that saved me. I'm the proud son of a plumber from Western Mass. I was fifth from the bottom of my high school class, and you would not want to have met the four guys below me. <laughs> <laughs> and then back in the, you know, now they call it a gap year, but back in the day they called it finding yourself. And so I did that for a couple of years, and then I stumbled into a junior college, and it saved me. Uh, it, it, it didn't just educate me, it energized and inspired me. And I believe ordinary people can do extraordinary things with a little inspiration. And then I got out of Babson, I was offered one job from a guy I met at a bar on West, on West Dennis Beach in Cape Cod. He happened to work for the consulting part of Arthur Anderson at the time. He said, here's the form. I turned in the form. They hired me. I had no idea what they did. And, you know, 25 years later, they asked me to run the place. So it just goes to show you, um, like the future is bright, and ordinary people can do extraordinary things um, if they're inspired. And so I'm delighted to be here today because uh, the thing you know about Accenture, we have 275,000 employees, is it's the next generation that's going to rule the world. And we can't wait to put it in your hands so you can do it. So I'm happy to be here today. Thank you, Bill. So to your point, 120 countries, 275,000 people. And until you were in the saddle recent, uh, until recently, 200, maybe 69,000 people. That's a lot of action going on. It can give you a high but there are also always the fear of lurking problems, either from the outside or from the inside. Somebody's careless action can mm. impact you. Mm. How did you sleep at night? Um, 
couple of martinis. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I, um, you know, it's a, you can never know the responsibility until you have the job, right? I mean, you can be the number two person in watching, you know, as a good student, but you can never feel the responsibility until you have the job. But at the end of the day, right, I mean, people rise to the occasion. And I always had just tremendous belief in, in what I call the men and women of Accenture. And it didn't matter where in the world they were, right? Because what the, we all shared was a common set of core values. We saw the world the same way. We were in this business to learn and grow and make a difference. We took pride in our relationships and our colleagues. Collaboration and teamwork was the name of the game, <clears throat> not infighting and silos and all that. And we always did this thing that I call solve for Accenture. Because in a big company, you can look at the company by country, you can look at it by industry, you can look at it by operating groups. But the decisions you make every day have to be good for the whole, not just your part. And sometimes you'll make a decision which isn't as good for your part, but it does solve for Accenture. I think the other thing we, we try to weave into the culture is uh, to never be afraid to change even when you're at the, you're the top of your game. And there's so many companies that get on a streak, things are falling into place, things are good. But there are always new entrants. There are always challenges from inside and from outside. And to have the courage to even when things are going just the way you wanted them to go, not be afraid to change. And it's sort of, I was brought up that way in the company. I grew up in that culture. Uh, and when I had the responsibility, I faced the world with that philosophy. And I think it served our company well and, and continues to. Bill, you and your predecessors certainly shaped a very unique and very powerful culture that deeply people believe in and it affects them. One of your favorite sayings used to be, I recall, it's about when somebody needs help. It's an honor to be asked and it's noble to respond. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to what's behind that? Yeah, I mean, it's an in, it was an interesting company because <clears throat> we share a common profit pool right? and we grew up together. My roommate in my first training class in 1978 was from Tokyo and I understood one out of every four words he said but we laughed and laughed and laughed and he ended up being the partner running Sony in Japan and I ended up working in electronics and high tech in the United States and I went to his retirement party 34 years later. And any time he picked up the phone and said, I could use your help, I'd say I'd be there in 24 hours. And so this notion of collaborating and teaming, this notion of you know, rising the tide all over, this notion of having a balance of you know, humility and confidence um, is just incredibly important. And the, Accenture on its best day, which was sort of, you know, what I woke up trying to make happen every day. You know, wasn't when we were, you know, knocking the ball out of the park. It was when we faced adversity and how we surrounded the people who were dealing with the adversity, professionally or personally, right, and helped them rise to the challenge. And that, that caring. I mean, people ask me in Accenture, uh, once, once I was at a session, we were teaching our new managers um, what it takes to be successful. It was a three-day session. It was in Atlanta. There were 600 people in the room. And I was there for the three days as an instructor. And over the three days, we gave the people, I counted, 68 things that if they were excellent at, they would be successful at Accenture. And I know this is Carnegie Mellon, you guys can multitask and stuff, but for a simple guy like me, <clears throat> 68 is too many. And so I said to myself, what would I say to them? And so I got up at the end of the thing after, you know, everybody had told them how they had to do their evaluations right and they had to be technically current and they had to do this. And I said, three things matter. The first one is competence. Whatever it is you choose to be good at, just be good at it. 
Don't work to get the job, the next job. Work to master the job you have. And if you do that, the organization will see and they will tap you on the shoulder and ask you to take more responsibility. The second thing is confidence. People want to know what you think. You know, in Accenture, we're a company of young people. And, you know, you work with CEOs that are 50, 60 years old. <clears throat> they, they actually want to know what you think. Um, they want the insights. And to have desirable self-confidence so you can give them your point of view. And then the third thing is caring. Giving a damn right, about your company, your clients, your customers, your colleagues, and your community, and the people around you, and letting it show. Wear it on the outside. And if you, coming up through an organization, can focus on competence, confidence, and giving a damn, the rest of the stuff falls into place. And that's sort of a theme that we've tried to build into our, our company. In your career and moving up to the top spot and your tremendous scope of, of responsibility, there must have been highs, but also emotionally wrenching moments. Can you talk to a few yeah, of those? Yeah, I mean, uh, two, of the things that, two of the things that influenced me the most, I think, weren't one thing happened in the firm and one thing in my family. Um, the first thing is, you know, you give blood to the company you work for. And then they, every once in a while, tell you what they think of your work. And sometimes it's not that pretty. They might put it in the coaching vernacular. <laughs> but um, I, as I always say, criticism causes people to raise their defenses. Challenge causes people to raise their game. And so how you deliver the coaching message is criticism or challenge. It's very subtle, but it is so powerful. And so once I was disappointed, the firm didn't think I had done well. It's like being bit by your own dog. You feed him every day, you pat him, then wham, the thing bites your hand. You're like, what? Right? And, and there were three of us in this thing, and the firm you know, thought badly of us. Well, one of the guys, he was in the West Coast. He didn't fly east of the Rockies for five years. Another one, he retired. And then they kept calling me saying, well, Bill's going to be upset. You know, we want to show him a little love. And I just said, look, I don't even want to talk about it. I'm just going back to work. But what I did is I separated my self-esteem from my role in the company. That's a very simple thing. And establish power in your person, not your position. And it, it, it unleashes you. It unleashes you to always do the right thing. Regardless of what the corporate party line is, the story, the politics, the drama, you know, just you know, be true to yourself and living your values and doing the right thing. And it was incredibly important for me because then I, you know, I did push against it. I did you know, have a maverick streak of sorts, which was about not criticizing the firm, but challenging it to be better. We can be better than this. The second thing that happened is when my son was, my two children adopted from Korea, both of them. And here's what pisses me off. Right? <clears throat> they didn't come with the chips. Now, if you adopt a young person from Korea, you expect a chip that speaks the language and one that's good at math. Right? <laughs> I, and. My daughter was a sociology major at the University of Vermont. Right? Doesn't, didn't get the math chip at all. I'm saying, you guys are Korean, right? You're supposed to be good at math, right? You're supposed to, <clears throat> you're supposed to be the Carnegie Mellon. You're not supposed to go to the University of Vermont, study sociology, right? But anyways, so I got these two, these, these two characters, Katie, who just got married, 27, and David, 25. Well, David, when he was three years old, had cancer, very serious cancer. And we went through surgery and chemotherapy and all that. And you know, this was 20-something years ago. And I don't know how the chemo is now, and I don't want to know. But I'm sure that pumped into a three-year-old 20-something years ago you know, wasn't a particularly good thing. But he got through that and all that. But he ended up with behavioral issues. And he ended up with learning disability things and things like that. And, but I, I remember that time. 
right? And I remember that, you know, I had this job at Accenture and then I had this young person. And the first time in my life, you know, I couldn't control the outcome. Right? It wasn't about me. There was nothing I could do. I was at the mercy of Children's Hospital, Dana-Farber, and the science of the time. And I learned that, you know, here's me, and I, I'm, I'm demanding of the people around me, but the, the Accenture people have stuff going on in their lives. They, their own, the only thing they have to do isn't just show up and make Accenture look good. And whether it's aging parents, it's sick children, it's relationship issues, it's health issues, to recognize that you take good people on any terms you can get them. And to make sure that when people have a challenge, right, <clears throat> they feel open about sharing it, and then the rest of the firm as a family right, can surround them and help them. And the firm surrounded me as a family. Right and help me. And it, it turned out later, um, um, they wanted me to consider being the CEO earlier than I ended up being it. And they said, Bill, would you <clears throat> be a candidate and be considered to be the CEO? And my son at that time was learning disabilities and behavioral stuff, and a tough period of time. Um, and I said, you know, no. People said, you know, why? I said, because this is more important. Right? So five years later, once I thought I had the kids sorted out, I had them at college in the Ham or high school in the Ham in Hampton, New Hampshire, special needs, learning, support, and all that. And he seems to be doing well. And they come back to me and they ask me, Bill, will you uh, consider being the CEO now? We really need you to do this. And I thought, you know, David's in a good place, you know. I don't know what this really means, but so I said yes. So maybe a month later, I'm in the car driving from LaGuardia to the uh, New York to a hotel to meet with the Accenture board, where I'm going to tell them all the things I'm going to do to take Accenture to the next level. And my cell phone rings, and it's David. And he said, Dad, they're going to throw me out of school today. And I said, this really isn't good timing, David, but, <laughs> but, it, but it's not a surprise. Well, actually, they gave him a stay of execution for a couple of days, and then when I came back from meeting with the board and accepting the role at Accenture, I then drove to New, Ham New Hampshire, backed my car up to the dorm, loaded his stuff in, and brought him back home. And then four high schools later, well, we finally got a piece of paper. So, but I say, that, I, I, I say that because of this, right? Life is complicated, right? And it gets more complicated as you go, go on. And you can, you, know, you can make it work for you, your family, and the people around you if you're open and honest about it and you work in an environment where people give a damn about each other. So I know that was a long answer, but it's just a little color on the couple of things that shaped me. But a terrific and very meaningful answer, so thank you for that, Bill. This may be a good point to open it up to the floor. We do have people on both sides, uh, both the aisles with mics. Raise your hand, we'll try and distribute it left side and right side. So who wants to be brave and go with the first uh, question? This gentleman here. Good morning, um, afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming out today. Uh, very appreciative of that story. Um, you've given us, I guess, an idea of what it took for you to get to where you are today. And you've been very open about the, the things that you've gone through and uh, made it very real. Could you talk about specifically some of your, um, would you feel some of the, the traits that you have uh, that helped you get to where you are now and, and uh, give us any uh, advice? Yeah, I mean, yeah. You, uh, <clears throat> well, let's just say I wasn't voted most likely to succeed in my high school <laughs> class, <laughs> right? So, um, no, I, you know, I, I think it's, a, I mean, what I lear learned as a young person, and, and I learned work ethic. I mean, like work, I came from a family of tradespeople, right? Plumbers, electricians, drywallers, and, in my family to this day, the highest form of accomplishment 
it's not that I have a master's degree from Babson or this Accenture CEO. It's, you know, can you wire this fixture? Can you do, no, I mean, this is, these are important things about who you are, right? Your comp, think about it, your competence, right? Your confidence and what matters to you. And so I always had an appreciation and, you know, Harsh and I have both spent some time on the shop floor in our, in our lives. And, you know, I always look at people, whether you're in the big chair or you're down on the shop floor, they're all the same to me. And because in there, right, is trapped talent. And in our companies and in our country, there is talent that's trapped, just looking to get out, saying, put me in, right? I can learn, I can grow, I can make a difference. And we need to do that as leaders in our companies, and we need to do that as leaders in our communities. And so when I'm not doing stuff like this, um, I uh, education reform evangelist of sorts and uh, get people from where they are to jobs in the shortest possible uh, time frame. But you know that was that was an important thing. And then you know I always you know recognized that it was never about me. Right? Um, it was always about the team, and we always worked that way. And I looked at my leadership team as interchangeable parts. And so you've, because it's easy to put people in a box, but you might have put them in the wrong box. And so you know, let them contribute to, the, the leadership challenge at Accenture was, how do you put people in the place they can make the biggest contribution? I mean, that's the sort of secret. Because you get those things mixed up and you sub-optimize in a profound way. Well, if you don't know the people, um, you can't do that. So the other thing that ma mattered to me was showing up. In fact, nobody in the office would sit between me and the coffee machine or me in the bathroom. Because Accenture is about clients, and clients aren't in the office. And so I had, I used to, back in the day, I had this piece of paper that said, what are you doing here, right? And I just go by and hold it up to the glass, right? Because there aren't clients there. And so showing up matters. And the other thing is to philosophically look at what are the things you need to get right? You know, we tend to try to get too many things right. And so my view in Accenture, we have to be relevant to the clients we serve and who pay us money. And we have to be relevant to the men and women that choose to have a career with us. And if we get those two things right, everything else falls into place. So a big part of me in being relevant was showing up. And so I would visit hundreds of clients a year. And I would do, in India, call, he could put me to work for a week doing town halls, but I would do town halls in every nook and cranny in every location we were. And it's not the theater, right? The, you know, the presentation. It's the coffee, it's the drink afterwards, it's the jokes, it's the personal stories. That's the stuff that gives you, I, when I look at Accenture as a company, you know, back to the competitive thing and the challenges, our competitors could copy everything that we do. Right? There's one thing they can't copy, and that's our secret sauce. Once the HR people had a contest, can you identify the secret sauce all over the world? And this group that serves Bristol Myers Squibb in New York from um, the Philippines uh, doing finance stuff won the contest. But I'm happy to tell you they didn't get it right because it wouldn't be a secret and then it wouldn't be the secret sauce. But wherever you are, right, find in that secret sauce. I just joined the board of EMC, a technology company, and they're all good friends of mine and they happen to be in Massachusetts. So for a guy that has been homeless for 35 years, it's kind of nice. But I went to the factory and I started there. I was telling a story earlier today and I'm walking through the factory with the vice president of manufacturing and one of the workers who tests circuit boards, I hear the name Bill and I look and it's Teddy, and I know Teddy. And so, you know, we're hugging in the factory and talking. And, you know, the factory workers are all saying, 
who's Teddy hugging a guy with a suit on? And, and the vice president of manufacturers saying, where'd he go down that aisle and start hugging the workforce, right? Well, <laughs> <laughs> but, but like people make the world go round, right? And the stuff you learn here on the sort of technical platform, the analytics, the insight, the ability to synthesize, the ability to get insights and intuition thing, incredibly powerful, but at the end of the day, right? It's the human condition that makes things go. And so, you know, I, I always said about Accenture, you could be a visionary, you could lead Accenture by being a visionary, or you could be an operator, or you could be a client guy. And I'm a client guy. So that just says, I gotta go have someone cook up vision. And those guys are a dime a dozen, right? I mean, thinking big <laughs> thoughts, right? Making lots of charts, right? Like, we have plenty of them, right? And then, or an operator, right? Turning the crank, making sure everyone shows up on time, counting the money and stuff, right? Good, good profession, I'm good with that. It's just not in my genes, right? But people are, right? And that's the customers. And so, you know, I just sort of live by those rules. And when business gets tough, it's the time you spend less time even at your, at your desk, you know, flying it from your desk. And you go out where the customers are, because that's where the learning is, and that's where the fun is. And in 30-something years, I had fun every single day at Accenture, and that's a pretty special thing. Before we go to the next question, and raise your hands, please, I want to ask you if the following story is true. <laughs> it relates to your dedication to customers. I believe you were keen on developing a relationship with Sikorsky, mm -hmm. Stratford, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. You said Jim Pateo yeah, is the right. guy. Yeah, yeah. He wouldn't give you an appointment, but right. we learned that he goes to lunch <laughs> at Ruby's. Well, I, you know, if you believe, right. so this is at a time when you know, big industrial times, Sikorsky Aircraft, Textron, General Dynamics, United Technologies, all the divisions. Our East Hartford guy knows them all, right? <laughs> um, and I believed I could really help this company. But like somewhere before me, some Accenture guy had, I don't know, thrown a cigarette butt in a bush and it caught fire or something. <laughs> like we were, we were like, you know, oh, those are the Accenture guys. You know, we'll, we'll <laughs> talk to IBM. Um, or, or, you know, <clears throat> some, some other misfits, right? But we won't, we won't talk. I, I know Ginny very well, and her sister actually works for me still, so uh -huh. our, our, our telecom business. Anyway, anyway but a um, little friendly fire. Um, but I knew the guy, you know, went to this Ruby's for lunch every day, and he had to walk across the street and across the parking lot. And so I went there. And I waited, and when he came, and I was a partner, right? I mean, I was, I was, you know, had my Volvo, right? And so this was in the 80s or something. And I, I, and he came out of the thing and I said, you know, I need to spend some time with you. I have some ideas, I think they're important. If you just give me 15 minutes of your time. And the guy was so moved that I actually went to this trouble that he, he said, how can I say no to this, right? Where'd you come from? Oh, hard for an hour and 15 minutes up the thing. I came down, I knew you had lunch here. You know, it wasn't like stalking him, but, <laughs> but, but I believed, right? I mean, the passion, right, came through. Like this guy must have something like that he feels strongly about. And, and, and if you're the client, your job is not to look the other way when someone might have an idea that helps you improve your performance. I mean, that's just, those are the rules of the game. And so we had the conversation, we had another one, and they were a client of mine for years and years and years. And that's yeah, it's still a client of the firm. <laughs> and, but it's, at the end of the day, right, it was me being myself. Right? And if there's anything that really is powerful is you, you get these textbook stereotypes of how you're supposed to be. It's nonsense, right? People want real people. And that was just me being me. And then it was him being him, saying, hey, this kid, I, you know, I was half his age, 
you know, gives a damn about this. And he's not saying, I got a hammer, you know, do you have a nail? You know, I did the work. I knew we had something that had helped him. So, go ahead. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm Namrata. Uh, a big responsibility as a CEO is to actually get a compatible team together. So I really want to understand how you uh, cherry-picked the people who were not great as individuals, but al also very collaborative as a team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's you have a bandwidth of... Some people have deep, incredible talent, but... Um, as, well, as I always say, class and character, tone and touch are things that matter. Right? Now, those things aren't in any textbook, but class, the, your character, right? Who you are, right? What you believe in. Your tone and your touch, right, are sort of the table stakes to be part of my leadership team. Because, you know, the people without personalities couldn't stand me. Um, and, and so, you know, they just didn't fit into the vibe, right? And vibe is incredibly important, right, in a team. You know, it's sort of like if everyone wants to be miserable, everyone on the team has to be miserable. If you're a good, happy-go-lucky, good-natured guy in a team of miserable people, you make them nuts and they make you nuts. But so vibe, right, matters, right? And yet, you know, mutual respect for everyone's, there's the common part of values and things that, are indisputable. And then everyone plays their part, and it gets back into putting them in the right roles. But you know, we were very thoughtful about um, w w when you work in a people-based company, you know each other like family. Um, and so we were very thoughtful about you know, strengths, coaching, being open. And so if people didn't fit, right, we found something that, that it fit them better, right, but didn't fit our thing. But interestingly, my successor, right, um, he's more of an analytic, you know, gene pool. And so his, you know, he has sort of a different, I always say to him, show the love, right, you got to show the love, right. And his, but his background, right, was very analytical, black, white, up or down, left or right, right? Very decisive, very focused. And so, you know, I, I always needed to learn to come, to come a little his way, and, you know, he needed to learn to come a little my way. But if, if, you're, if you can be open and honest and not afraid to show some warts, people help you, right, come together. And that, that's sort of what we always had. Nobody, had. nobody ever had fear. Nobody ever felt threatened. Nobody felt on thin ice. People felt they were part of the team or they'd be asked to do something that maybe was better suited for them. And you know, we just developed a nice rhythm and a nice vibe. And when I became the CEO, there were three or four people who were planning to retire that said, hey, I'll go on this ride. And so they put off their retirement, some of them for a long time, and just said, hey, you know, this looks like fun. Well, go give it a go. And, and so that, those are friends for life, right? I mean, sort of in the end, it doesn't have anything to do with work, right? Those are people that, you know, I still talk to, you know, every week. We'll go to that lady there. But before that, I want to just comment on, we'll come after that to you. Uh, several years ago, Bill was visiting India, and I had the honor of taking him to a client, uh, Radhika India Post. Mm -hmm. if, I remember that. If you have India Post, 1.3 billion people, it's a huge organization, much larger no than the No zip codes. Right? It's, it's the post office with no zip codes. Bengal, <laughs> Bengal night runners. So in the car, as we were approaching, I thought, I should alert Bill. We were having some difficulty getting this worldwide expert from Italy, Brian Moran, mm -hmm. right? right? And I didn't want him to get sabotaged, so I told Bill, and I said, then I thought, oh my goodness, what will he think of me? But then I realized I need not have any anxiety because Bill's been in the trenches. Question. 
Hi again. So the walk is. <laughs> but you remember. The walk is same as the walk. But you remember when you told me that I picked up the phone. Oh, you. <laughs> and I called the U.S. that guy's boss, and I said, "I'm here at India Post." Harsh and these people are working their butts off to do some good work from them, and they need this guy here. Thank you. <laughs> right now, so, just... absolutely true. Before we reach Radhika's office, India Post, Parliament Street, Bill was on the phone talking to Steve Rowleader. Yep. <laughs> Steve Rowleader is not that guy's boss. Man, he heads the whole public right. sector for, right. <laughs> for uh, Accenture Worldwide. So. But he's Texan. He's from Texas, right? So he likes a good challenge, right? You say, hey, St Steve, I know you're in Austin, right? But I need one, your guy from Italy down here. And you know, a Texan, right? Don't mess with Texas, right? They're just like on it, right? And that, but that's, but that's, that's a cultural. That's a just a demonstration of giving a damn, right? Go the ahead. point is, the walk is the same as the talk. I, I just wanted to say it was really nice to meet you earlier, and thank you for coming today. Um, out of Accenture's six core values, um, client value creation, uh, one global network, respect for the individual, best people. I used to work there, integrity and stewardship. Uh, which, <laughs> yes. uh, which, love I love that. which core value do you feel <clears throat> resonated with you most in your career and why? Um, well, one of our core values, and I, I have a favorite core, core value, which I suppose isn't good politics, right? I should treat all the core values the same, be politically correct, right? You're all the respect for the individual. You're just as important as one global network. But my favorite core value, my favorite core value is stewardship. Now, stewardship is a word. I don't know, and you grow up a plumber's son, stewardship is not a word in the family vocabulary, right? So, like, it wasn't until Accenture I got, till I got, heard the word, and then it took me a while to figure out what does stewardship mean? And, 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 and I'll just translate into Accenture language. <laughs> stewardship means this, right? People went before you and built this great company. And then they had the confidence to put it in your hands. And your job as an Accenture person is to make it better and take it to the next level. And then at the right time, put it in the hands of the next generation so they can take it to a level that maybe you can't even fathom. And it's, it is so powerful, right? And when I, I loved my job being the CEO and the chairman. Loved it, right? Um, I wasn't out of gas. I was still doing good stuff. We were at the top of our game. I was still having fun every day. And people said, why are you going to leave? And I said, because it's time. And I didn't mean because it's time because I hit 65 or something. I didn't mean because it's time because I'm out of gas. It meant. It's time to put the firm in the next generation's hands. And so that's what stewardship means, right? And I could tell you <clears throat> today, the people that worked for me on Sikorsky aircraft that made me look good, right? That carry the water, that carried the stuff on their backs. Our men and women carry our firm on their backs every day, right? And they deserve a chance to lead, to own, to run. And, <clears throat> and they never disappoint you. And so you former Accenture <clears throat> people, who like Harsh have lost their way, <laughs> to go to Carnegie Mellon, I'm fine with that. It's your money. Um, <clears throat> but somewhere you might s see the light again. Right? As Harsh did and come back. You know, think about Harsh, right? He came back to the firm, right? We had, we had a company, we started hiring people in India. Right? Um, you know, nobody in the firm had ever been to India, hardly. But we said, these people are great, the talent is great. And, we, and, and then we put it in Harsh's hands, right? And 90,000 people later, some of our best leaders across our company globally grew up in that business. 
we put it in their hands, right? That, that's stewardship. And so that's the thing that you know, always, I always think of. Right? And I'll tell you, it's, it's an incredible relief right? that when I do leadership development programs, town halls, <clears throat> in India, if you do a town hall, <clears throat> the ladies usually sit in the front. And it's usually a lady who says, Mr. Green, what do I have to do to have your job? I mean, it's <laughs> like, and if you say 25 years of hard labor, they'll say, OK, just tell me what I have to do. Right? The ambition, the aspiration, and for people to know right, that they can run this firm. So when the plumber son from Massachusetts right, started working, did I ever think I could run the firm? But I did. And the guy that runs it's now a guy from Lyon in France, right? And did he think, and somewhere in Accenture today, a new recruit has entered our office in Helsinki. And 20 years from now, they may run the firm. That is the kind of place you want to work. That's what stewardship is. And to know that I was putting the firm in the hands of people that are so much better than I was at their vintage in the firm, you just say, this firm is in good hands, not for years to come, for generations to come. And that is what builds a, you know, one of the world's great companies, which is what, what we were solving for. Gentlemen here. Yeah. How was uh, Accenture uh, able to reinvent themselves into this very successful organization after the downfall of Arthur Anderson? Yeah, no, I think, you know, it's a good question. If you go back in history, right, <clears throat> um, Arthur Anderson was accounting firm, and in 1954, um, we installed the first computer for business purposes. Computers were for scientific purposes then. We installed the first computer for business purposes in 1954 at GE Appliance Park, and it did payroll. And had we kept the intellectual property, I guess I wouldn't be here. Right? Life would be good. Anyway, um, but so we started the technology and, and the, you know, the advice. And the, but we're always, as consulting firms go, there's the guys that write the books, and there's the guys that do the work. Right? You know, we are the plumbers, right? We have all the levels, but we have people that do the work, right? Don't just come up with the idea. Don't just tell me how to do it, but bet your badge that you can do it. And that's a huge differentiator for us. And so we started that. And what happens is, you know, there's, you, you start developing different cultures within the same company. And the accounting and tax culture went like this, and the consulting culture went like that. And we saw the world differently. We saw clients differently. We were sort of engineered and wired differently. And so we separated the businesses you know, for a long time. And then ultimately, um, we had an arbitration <coughs> that separated the businesses permanently into what at the time was Anderson Consulting and what was Arthur Anderson. Then a few years later, you know, Arthur Anderson, which, which I worship. I mean, uh, I was trained by them. I learned most of what I know about integrity, discipline, rigor, client service from them. You know, got in this place with Enron and all that stuff. At an incredibly bad time, at the end of the day, um, Every lawsuit against the company has been dismissed, but they put the company out of business. 86,000 people who, you know, yes, they did some stuff wrong, um, but it's criminal. And now, with only four big accounting firms, we need eight, right? We, we need more. Um, but, but there's a lesson in the Arthur Anderson thing. So we have great respect for the, the people that were partners there, and were our partners and our friends. I, we, were just, we just grew apart business-wise. But to this day, we had nothing but respect for those people. But there is a lesson there, right? And that is your brand 
is precious. Right? Your brand is precious. And all it takes is one person, in this case, Houston, one person in Houston for this global firm to be put under such siege. And I had, I'll tell my little, do I have a little minute? Yeah, of course. I'm running over, Harsh. All right, okay, I'm going to tell you one. Okay. Okay. No, well, here, so I had my brand under, under fire because we sponsored Tiger Woods. Where's the Titleist guy? I saw the hat back there. And, there you are, there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, Tiger Woods, uh, for six years, we sponsored him. Anyone who's been through an airport saw we wallpapered the place with Tiger. In six years, he was nothing but class and excellence. Right? This is the stuff they don't teach in business school. Right? In six years, he, he served Accenture well. Our people work with the Tiger Woods Foundation. Like We did all this stuff. We had a terrific relationship. And what we were trying to do is establish a brand as high performance delivered. And those of you who golf or back in those days, and even in India, where people didn't golf that much, they do much more now, as a recruiting person, people said, look at this man, right? And, you know. and then Tiger loses his way. Right? And whatever you, whatever you think is true or not, or however you judge that, I don't, right? But here's what I know. He worked for me incredibly well for six years. But the brand Accenture is precious. And when behavior starts reflecting on your brand, you have to protect your brand. And so from the day after Thanksgiving, whenever that year was, where his agent called me and said, minor, minor fender bender, no big deal, to two weeks later, when I had to negotiate with the Wall Street Journal on a Sunday while the Patriots were playing in Houston, I remember it like yesterday, uh, to give them a 25-minute lead on the online story that we were going to you know, uh, stop our relationship with Tiger Woods. To the thing of 64 airports in 27 countries wallpapered with this man, who now I need to, and I just say, well, just get some of the kids, send them down to the airport, take the picture down. Oh, no, there's a union, right? You got to make a schedule. You got to get the key to the thing. So anyways, I get all that done. <laughs> I get all that done, and, and we're in the basement of Accenture looking for stuff, right? As we've taken down all this wallpaper, and we got to put up some new stuff, or else IBM would take this base, right? So, so we have this elephant on the surfboard. And so we have a commercial, right, with an elephant on a surfboard, you know, signaling your flexibility and agility. I don't know what it is, right? So, so well, Wall Street Journal asks, as part of this negotiation, they say, we want, the, we want to see, get the first look at the new commercials. So we send them the elephant on the surfboard, and we start running on TV the elephant on the surfboard, and we do a... a copy in the Wall Street Journal. And who calls me that morning? PETA, the people for the ethical treatment of animals, right? <laughs> and they say, did you make the elephant get on the surfboard? <laughs> right? so, you can't make this shit up. <laughs> so I would just leave you. I would just leave you with, I'm sure they're teaching you lots of good stuff here. Right? Right? But some of it, that you're going to experience out there, whether it's in interpersonal things, whether it's in business things, whether it's regulatory things, some of it you can't make up. And so just keeping a smile on your face, a sense of humor, um, and recognizing that the best is yet to come. Right? For us as individuals, for the companies and organizations we serve, for the institutions that have served us so well as this one does you, and for the communities in which we work and live. So think stewardship, because Harsh and I soon are going to put this thing in your hands. We're counting on you. Thanks. Thank you, Bill.